Hi, everyone. Yes, do not be concerned about the lack of sound. We're moving into our prelude at this time. Good morning, everyone. And now we will hear chalice lighting words read by today's preacher, the Reverend Elizabeth Wynne from the writings of pioneer Shirley Chisholm. I love America, not for what she is, but for what she can become. And any time things appear to be going better, you have overlooked something. A cautionary tale. Thank you, Elizabeth. We look forward to hearing more from you this morning. These now are opening words written by our late Minister Emeritus Jack Mendelson inspiration for today's Spirit of Democracy Sunday. Jack said this, here in this sanctuary of ancient dreams and wisdom and beauty, we come to grow, to be healed, to stretch mind and heart, to be challenged, renewed, to be helped in our own continuing struggles for meaning and for love. 
to help build a world with more justice and mercy in it, to be counted among the hopers and doers. In the face of cynicism, darkness, brutality around us and within, we seek to align ourselves with a living community that would affirm rather than despair, that would think and act rather than simply adjust and succumb. Here, we invite the spirit of our own humanity and the healing powers under, around, through, and beyond it to give us the nerve and grace, the toughness and sensitivity to search out the truth that frees and the life that maketh all things new. Again, good morning, everyone. I am not yet confident that all things now are new, but in recent days, at least some things have been madeeth new. And in this parched time, we are thankful for every bit of refreshment that cometh our way, eh? Welcome if you're here for the very first time or if you have been here pretty much forever. And if you're new, please say hi in the chat or go to our webpage at uubedford.org and just like Willie Mays, say hey, say hey. Announcements. This Tuesday at 7.30, there will be a discussion of Naomi Klein's book, On Fire, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal. The Zoom link can be found in our newsletter. There will not be a book discussion today, but come on Tuesday, whether or not you've read the book. That is the kind of book discussion I like. Today is also the debut of a closed captioning system called REV, R-E-V, on Zoom. It is activated now and you can mess around with it, feel free, and perhaps you can figure out for yourself how to get everything subtitled. But don't worry too much about it now because next Sunday morning we'll have a few minute tutorial in the service to make sure everyone knows how to use it. And yes, today is our annual Spirit of Democracy Sunday. If you did not know him, Jack Mendelssohn was one of the foremost liberal religious humanist leaders of the 20th century. Bedford was the last full stop in Jack's career, and he served our congregation from 1979 to 1988, when he then became our minister emeritus until his death in 2012. Jack went into the ministry to make the world a better place. It was that simple, that audacious. Racial justice was at the center of his ministry. When Al Sharpton preached from this pulpit a number of years ago, I asked Al what he wanted to be when he was young. Without missing a beat, he said, as a child, I wanted to grow up to be Jack Mendelssohn. It wasn't true, of course, but Jack loved it, and, well, Al knows how to work a crowd. All his life, Jack worked to bring all who are marginalized to the center, people of color, but also women, youth, elders, the differently abled, LGBT folks, and more. He advised Adlai Stevenson, for gosh sakes, Robert Kennedy, and Jesse Jackson. Kitty Dukakis, who preached this service one year, sat in an Arlington Street Church pew with her husband to hear Jack. Jack drank martinis with Richard Cardinal Cushing. Jack ran for president of our denomination, the UUA, and I'm wearing his campaign button, Jack, and Jack lost that race, largely due to the edginess of his anti-racism advocacy 
among UUs. And then when Reverend Billy, Savitri D, and the Church of Stop Shopping did this service not long before Jack died, he was canonized, Saint Jackalooya. Billy and Savi may be here with us this morning, just by the way. Democracy, alluya. Jack adored and respected his wife, Judith Fridiani, and she is here with us as well. It was Jack's idea to call this the Spirit of Democracy Sunday, and he chose as its mission statement these words of the great reformer and community organizer, Jane Adams, whom Jack regarded as my Jesus. Jane Adams said this, to attain individual morality in an age demanding social morality, to pride oneself on the results of personal effort when the time demands social adjustment is utterly to fail to apprehend the situation. We are learning that a standard of social ethics is not attained by traveling a sequestered byway, but by mixing on the thronged and common road where all must turn out for one another and at least see the size of one another's burdens. This is the foundation and guarantee of democracy. Thank you everyone this morning. Thank you for not sequestering too much and for turning out for one another and for so many beyond ourselves and to at least see the size of one another's burdens. I really don't know what Annie will say when she introduces her friend and housemate, Elizabeth. So I want to say that I asked Elizabeth to preach today, not just because she's a former student of Judith's at Harvard, and not just because she and I were arrested together at a West Roxbury pipeline protest, but most especially because I believe Elizabeth is one of the most inspiring, compelling, and prophetic voices in our movement today. Thank you, Elizabeth, for being with us. No pressure. Democracy, alleluia. And now we'll join in the words of our unison affirmation. Together, I want to see your muted lips move. We begin. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. El amor es el espíritu de esta iglesia, y el servicio es su ley. Este es nuestro gran pacto, vivir juntos en paz, buscar la verdad en el amor, y ayudarnos los unos a los otros. And now we move on to a time for all ages with Deb Weiner. Thank you so much, John, and good morning, all. I am really excited to share with you a story that is based on real things going on, and it is indeed about our new Vice President, Kamala Harris, and her sister, Maya. And it's called Kamala and Maya's Big Idea. You know what should be out there, Kamala asked her sister Maya. Us, said Maya. A slide, said Kamala. And a swing, Maya added. A playground, they shouted together. Kamala and Maya had an idea. It was a very good idea and a very big idea and they were going to need help. Wouldn't it be great if there was a playground in the courtyard, Maya asked. That does sound nice, Mommy said. 
How can we make that happen, Kamala asked. Well, I suppose the first step would be to ask the landlord, the person who owns the building. So Kamala wrote a letter and Maya drew a picture and they went to see the landlord to discuss their idea. The landlord thought about it for less than a second. Hmm, I don't think so, no. That was not the answer they wanted, but they were not ready to give up. That night, the sisters tried to think of ways to turn a no into a yes. So they asked the other kids in the building if they wanted a playground in the courtyard. Did they? Of course they did. And they had ideas too. Let's have a teeter-totter and a basketball hoop and flowers. So Kamala wrote a longer letter and they went to see the landlord together. The landlord thought about it for less than five seconds. A project that big is expensive. We don't have the money for that. Do your parents know that you're here? This was not the answer that they wanted, but Kamala was not ready to give up. If we ask our parents and do it all ourselves, can we fix up the courtyard? The landlord thought about that for a whole 10 seconds. Finally, he shrugged. If you can do it yourselves, sure. This wasn't exactly the answer they wanted, but it was a start. The kids all spoke to their parents about their ideas for the courtyard. They hung up posters and they knocked on neighbors' doors, but they got the same answers from everyone. I'm sorry. Wow, that is a big job. Wish I could help. Which they knew meant no, no, no. But then Mr. Green stopped to talk. I work in construction. Maybe I could get some scrap lumber and some sand for a sandbox. Really, Kamala said. Yes, exclaimed Maya. Okay, I'll try. It wasn't a guess, but right now, maybe was the sweetest word they had ever heard. Maybe gave them hope. The next weekend, maybe turned into yes. The kids all helped to measure and Mr. Green cut the boards. Then they sanded and they hammered and they sanded some more and then came the actual sand. They were all thanking Mr. Green when Ms. Lopez stopped to talk. I work at a garage. Maybe they have an extra tire for a teeter-totter. Another maybe. Well, in the weeks that followed, lots of I don't knows turned into maybes and yeses. No one could do everything, but everyone could do something. Kamala and Maya wanted to celebrate, wanted everyone to celebrate the new playground. So they made another big poster, inviting their neighbors to a potluck party. There were hot dogs and hummus, spicy chicken and potato salad, strawberries and brownies and lemonade. Mrs. Flores set up a sprinkler for the kids to run through and Mr. Green brought the music. Kamala admired the new playground, but she noticed that there was still one thing missing. No one knew how to make a slide, but Ms. Flores knew where they might buy one. I teach at Emerson Elementary and they are redoing their playground. Maybe we could buy the old slide. This was a different kind of maybe. A how can we afford that maybe? But now everyone was trying to find a way to turn maybe into yes. These brownies are delicious. Maybe we could have a bake sale. 
we can all bring toys and books and have a sidewalk sale. No one could do everything, but everyone could contribute something. Well, when the slide arrived at last, Maya and Kamala got the first ride. The landlord was impressed. I want to shake your hands, girls, he said. You did a good job. You all did a good job. Kamala and Maya had an idea. It was a very good idea and a very big idea. And with a lot of help, they made it happen. Hooray for Kamala and Maya. Hooray for the Purr sisters. What's next, Kamala? Kamala, looking up, said, I'm wondering what the view is like from the roof. And as you know, author Mina Harris has told this story based on the lives of her mother, Maya Harris, who you see on the right, with Kamala Davy Harris, 49th Vice President of the United States. Hurrah! Hurrah, indeed. Well, I get the distinct honor of introducing Reverend Elizabeth Wynn, though John got us started in a good direction. Um, and I will say that Elizabeth is someone who looks out the window, sees what the community needs, and gets to turning no's into yeses. Whether that's the Unitarian Universalist community cooperatives that started to co-op houses in Boston, or the Boston Immigration Justice Accompaniment Network that just turned three years old, working to get people free from immigration jail and reduce the harm of our racist immigration systems. She's out there finding the people that can make things happen together. In our five and a half years as housemates, I've seen her minister in a wide variety of contexts, from working with youth at Boston Mobilization, to working with Unitarian Universalist youth and young adults of color all over the country. I've seen her preaching and leading worship on the main stage of a UU ministers conference to hundreds of our colleagues. And I've seen her chaplaining families going into the Burlington ICE office, not knowing if they would come out together or not. In her current paid work, she works for the National Bond Fund Network, doing ministry across multiple languages and time zones, across the walls of prisons and across borders, working to get people free. And wherever she goes, she's always building relationships, bringing a fierce commitment to doing what is right, what is just and liberating, and usually feeding people and it's always delicious, even when it's made from the scraps of the CSA that no one wanted to cook with that she found in the bottom drawer of the fridge because we don't waste food at our house. That is not right or liberating. So with that, I will pass it over to Elizabeth who will be introducing our musical interlude for us. Thank you, Annie for that very warm introduction and John as well. It is truly an honor and very humbling to be with you all this morning for all of the reasons that you all know so well. Our musical interlude is Sing Out, March On by Joshua Campbell. Campbell was a student at Harvard participating in walkouts over the police murder of Black people in 2015 when he wrote this song and he famously performed it for the late great representative John Lewis when Lewis spoke at Harvard's commencement and I've been listening to it a lot these days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
march through the storm and I march through the rain and I march through some sickness and some heartache and pain and I laid on the ground and I looked up at the sky and I pray to the Lord up above and ask why. But oh no, I'm not tired. I'm not through marching yet. And I'm a march until I die. Oh, children, this you can bet. And we'll say, I, I'm gonna sing out. I'm gonna march on. Everybody said, I. Hey y'all, it's Joshua here. We hope that song meant something to you. Now, if you believe like we do that in the times we live in, we have no choice but to sing out and march on, then click the link in the description to donate to the Southern Poverty Law Center. Thank you for being here with us. I invite you to join in the spirit of prayer. Taking a big, Breath in if you can, sensing the love that radiates out, that connects us to each other. Spirit of love and justice, of loneliness and loss and worry and sickness, addiction, aging, brokenheartedness. May we find a way forward, grieving our losses. 
and honoring all that is to come. May we also honor new life, healing, connection, transformation, all that we're learning, all that is growing. And on this Spirit of Democracy Sunday, we give thanks for all protectors of democracy and fairness and justice through the ages. We give thanks to Mendelssohn and Chisholm and Abrams and those more ancient and newer. Give us and them the strength to practice wide welcome to all who want a world where we all thrive and the deep integrity to never compromise on what our people deserve. Give us wide welcome, deep integrity, ways forward. Amen, and may it be so. Indeed, amen, and may it be so. I'm introducing our offering this morning, and before the service, I was recalling that Jack was known for, perhaps was even notorious for paying close attention to the offering. I don't think he counted it every Sunday, but each week he paid attention to it to the penny. I don't do that, but I wouldn't want you to think I don't care. I do care. And what we do in the offering makes what we do possible in so many ways. I particularly want to call your attention in the order of service. I believe there is a list of those who have contributed to the Spirit of Democracy Fund. And this special Sunday is made possible by special contributions to that uh, fund, and we're grateful for those over the many years who have contributed. You can always uh, send a check to the church and take note that it is for the Spirit of Democracy Fund. Uh, also, there is in our online giving platform, Give Plus, a, a special box so that you may check the box and contribute uh, to the church generally, but you may also check the box and give in particular to the Spirit of Democracy Fund. That's the Give Plus button on our web page. So with that, I say as ever, freely we have received, freely give for the good work of this congregation in this wide, windy world. Our offering will now gratefully be received.
When I was a kid, my mom used to let us nominate New Year's resolutions for her, which was quite a bold move. She was very clear that she would not necessarily adopt our proposed resolutions, but that she was very curious to hear them and would take them into consideration. One year, I famously told her that my resolution for her was no more church meetings. My childhood was full of staying after church on Sunday afternoons while my mom went to this religious education committee meeting or that while I wandered the halls of Tennessee Valley Unitarian Universalist Church where I grew up scavenging for snacks and entertainment. I clearly had a different vision for my weekends and was glad to finally get an opportunity to shape my material reality. Alandria Williams, the late and beloved moderator of our Unitarian Universalist Association who died suddenly this year, was an expert in cooperative economics and liberatory governance. Alandria wrote, if you never get to feel democracy, you can never contest anything bigger than you. You need that to go on and continue. When my mom asked me as a kid what my New Year's resolution for her would be, it gave me some sense of feeling like I had a say in my own circumstances, even though she made it very clear that it was me giving feedback, that in no way was she going to commit to quitting her life of extraordinary lay leadership in our faith, it still blew my mind to be given that invitation into imagination, a tiny bit of say in the governance of our life as a family. I felt a tiny bit of the democracy Alandria wrote about. I didn't feel it fully because I didn't have it in that moment but I did taste its power, its promise, its potential. And this is where I think we are as a democracy. We can taste the power, the promise, and the potential. And what we live with is so much less. And to Alandria's point, if so many of us never feel that we have the power to shape our own lives, it can be very hard to feel like we can shape the lives of our communities, our counties, this country. And we may also not even be sure that a democracy fully realized is even the most just system of governance. This week, amongst the many symbols of our potential and power and the inadequacies of our current democracy, Annie's five-year-old decided that her favorite thing was to chant, this is what democracy looks like pose. We have no idea where this came from, or we sort of do. Maybe it came from music class on Zoom kindergarten. But it reminded me that of the many times that I have chanted, this is what democracy looks like at a protest. I've always felt the dissonance because usually what was happening in that moment was anything but democracy or a just system of governance. In the streets for Black Lives Matter, protesting the violence of policing in a world where the people most policed have the least power to shape policing. At immigration court, protesting immigration policies where undocumented people most impacted by those very policies cannot vote in the electoral processes that supposedly shape those policies. In Dewey Square in Boston as part of the Occupy movement for economic justice in a political system where being wealthy allows you more power than almost anything else to shape economic policy. Now, of course, it could be said that the protest itself, that is supposed to be the part that feels like democracy. But I have to say that I don't think freedom to protest as part of a strong and good democ, sorry, but I have to say that I think the freedom to protest an undemocratic government is still not the full democracy that we need and deserve.
and an, an inauguration of a president that many people voted for and many did not, while 11 million undocumented people could not, while a racist electoral college system, voter suppression, gerrymandering, big money in politics, all of these things rage on, is not the fullest democracy we need or deserve. And a system of governance striving for democracy, but with the enslavement of black people, the denial of the vote to anyone except white wealthy men and genocide and the stealing of land of native nations at its center may not be the system that will serve liberation for the most of us. The inaugural poet Amanda Gorman writes, somehow we weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We are, I think, very broken and unfinished in this country and in many others. In the wider world, we are so very unfinished. We are less than 75 years, even fewer from independence, from colonialism for many nations, less than 50 from the end of the Cold War. Our global experiments in systems of economics and governance are babies in the arc of human existence. And I do not know the one way that will bring the most surviving and thriving to the most people on this planet. But I do know that there are many ways to move forward and that we're in a long legacy of freedom fighters and rabble rousers that reach back to peasants and serfs who dreamed of owning their own land, their own means of production, to farm for themselves and not a king, with many, many stops along the way. Roman assemblies and tea parties and revolutions for independence and last week. What we need regardless of what it's called, is just governance and the power for all people to shape our material realities. Campbell's words from our song. I marched through the storm and I marched through the rain. I marched through some sickness and heartache and pain. I laid on that ground, looked up at the sky and prayed to the Lord above and asked why. But I'm not tired. I'm not through marching yet. We'll march till we die. This we can bet. We'll sing out. We'll march on. Shirley Chisholm, who became the first Black woman elected to the United States Congress in 1968 and the first Black candidate for a major party's nomination for president, said those two things. I love America not for what she is, but for what she can become. And anytime things appear to be going better, we have overlooked something and she is right, both. Broken and unfinished, becoming and also not yet better. From our time for all ages, we are maybes trying to figure out how to turn into yeses. Our ancestors marched and maybe also were marched against. And many of us, we may wish that it was not something that we would have to do or our children would have to do. So back to Alandria's question, where can we feel democracy these days? Where is the unfinished becoming? These are three places that I feel democracy these days. One, the poet David White says, start close in. We can practice just governance, just democracy at the smallest level, strengthening our muscle at every scale of our lives. One thing, we can lead like our people elected us. The point of electing people to govern us, as I understand it, whether they be school board members or city councilors, PTA presidents, congregational presidents, the president, is that through electing them, we exercise accountability. They are accountable to us. We supposedly get to support them with our vote or withdraw our support by not voting for them. 
we each in our own lives can also lead like we are accountable to the people we serve and the people we most impact. We can orient ourselves based on who we want to be accountable to and act as if those people get to decide whether we stay in our roles. My mom doing a small version of that, asking me what my New Year's resolution might be for her. We can lead like the patients most struggling for health, get to decide if we keep our job in healthcare, like the students most struggling to learn, get to decide if we keep our job in education. Two, another place that I see the unfinished becoming. To be unapologetic and visionary about what we deserve, do not give in to false solutions. The majority of people in this world want to live a good, healthy life in a warm, safe home where love thrives. The majority of people in this country want homes for all, health care for all, jobs for all, education for all, a clean environment, the ability to move to another place if we need to or choose. In some ways, we actually have a lot of consensus across a very wide variety of people's lives about what individual people want for their day-to-day -day life. This is not to say that white supremacy is not a violent threat to life everywhere. This is not to say that the organizing that is before us for the next four years and eight and always will not be wildly challenging. Our wins at the state and local levels make, that make people's lives materially better have been few and far between over the past decades. But I do believe, and it feels like a bit of a risk and an act of faith to say, but I do believe that there is a majority mandate for the things we humans need to survive and thrive. And three, another place that the unfinished is becoming is in our wild experiments. As Annie mentioned, I work for the National Bail Fund Network, a network of community groups that fundraise to pay bail or bond so that people don't remain in jail or prison just because they don't have the funds. A few months before Alandria died, they texted me to say that we should talk about the resources these bail and bond funds have, that we needed to leverage the outpouring of resources into a real investment in long-term community well-being. They wrote to me, people understand if they are wealthy, they need to not just feed the system, but feed what communities need. Especially if we can have participatory distribution assemblies led by families and folks that have been impacted by state violence. I had never thought about that, of lost family to police violence could decide what to do with a sum of money, maybe use it for a bereavement leave their jobs might not include, or to sue the local police department for its abuses, or for therapy, or the burial, or for college for the deceased's kids. We must experiment wildly in democracy at every level. My family is here in this country in part because of the results of experiments in governance. In my family's case, a communist government that rose to power to fight for an independent Vietnam free of colonialism. Experiments have costs. There are wars and coups and takeovers and trusted leaders betray trust and ideologies become corrupted by human greed. But the journey toward just governments, governance is young. We may not have wanted to keep singing marching on. We may have wanted it to all be figured out by now. But it turns out that we are people of faith for a reason. We are literally called to have faith that there is a just system of governance out there in here, perhaps something like a democracy that is worth fighting for, manifesting here and now, 
to, in Jack Mendelssohn's words, think and act rather than simply adjust and succumb to believe in that life that maketh all things new or at least newer. To practice living it in our own lives, to come back to the human needs we know all people have, to experiment wildly and resiliently. The only way is the one that we are birthing right now in 2021 amidst a pandemic, amidst a revealed white supremacist bloc in this country who did indeed vote for oppression and greed. There is no easy solution. The people who work and love and thrive and live and struggle in this land called the United States by some have about as much say in the governance of our lives as I did as a 10 year old asking my mom to consider slightly fewer church meetings. And we have the spiritual muscle to hold the contradictions, a vision of just governance that falls short each and every day. Last Monday is both the same and so very different than tomorrow. Tomorrow there is no Muslim ban. There will be a pause on some deportations. Science and medicine will fight this pandemic. And the machines of injustice will crush on. People will be deported and made homeless and hurt by police and suffer under inadequate health care. There is few reasons to hope it will get better and many reasons to hope it will. When Stacey Abrams had the governorship stolen from her in the 2018 election, she refused to concede. And she said, I implore each of you not to give in to that anger or apathy, but instead turn to action because the antidote to injustice is progress. I am supposed to say nice things and accept my fate. They say, as a leader, I should be stoic in my outrage and silent in my rebuke, but stoicism is a luxury and silence is a weapon for those who would quiet the voices of the people and I will not concede. And at the end of the interview with Alandria that I've been quoting, they said, it's impossible for me to do work around developing economic cooperatives without stopping systemic violence in my community. There will be no one left to be in the cooperative if everyone is jailed or murdered. How can we meet our needs and how do we not just survive but thrive as entire communities? There have been many moments these past four years and before that where wars were started or LGBTQ rights denied whole communities of people jailed or deported, where I have doubted that we can meet our needs, that we cannot just survive but thrive, doubted that we have the power to shape our material realities. But always from somewhere, the wisdom of Shirley Chisholm and Stacey Abram and Amanda Gorman has come. Do not concede. I love America not for what she is, but for what she can become. It is broken and unfinished. There is a new way that is always being born despite it all. Oh no, I'm not tired. We're not through marching yet. We're gonna sing out. We're gonna march on. Amen and blessed be.
Wow, what a morning it is. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, most especially Elizabeth. Jack would be so happy. Thank you for calling us to higher ground. Thank you for speaking to our condition of being broken as well as unfinished. 